In this video, I'm going to look at the experiment that we use to measure the relative rates of hydrolysis of the haloalkanes. And I'm recording this video from Jack Austin and Vicky's bench. So just a reminder of the hydrolysis reaction. So we take a haloalkane, so that's the Rx, and we react it with water. We heat it up and we get an alcohol form, so that's the ROH, and we make the hydrogen halide, which will be aqueous. So it'll be H plus aqueous and X minus aqueous, an aqueous halide ion. And the other way to do it is to take a source of aqueous hydroxide ion, so something like sodium hydroxide aqueous, react that with the haloalkane. Obviously it needs some heat and we get the alcohol and again we get an aqueous halide ion. Okay, so if we focus on this method here where we use water, hot water, to hydrolyze the um, haloalkane, kind of try to visualize it here. So if we have this as our beaker at the start of the reaction, so haloalkane and water, and we're going to time how long it takes for the reaction to take place. So the species in the beaker at the end of the reaction would be the alcohol and the aqueous halide ion and H plus ion. So basically, we need a way of working out how long this reaction takes, and then to turn that into a rate, we just do one divided by that time. So the way we do that is we add some aqueous silver nitrate solution to the beaker at the start. So what that will do is it will introduce silver ions, aqueous silver ions. The nitrate ions don't really take a part in the reaction. So because we've got silver ions in there, when the halide ion forms, the aqueous halide ion forms, it can react with the aqueous silver ions from the silver nitrate and it will generate a precipitate, a silver halide precipitate. So there's just a reminder of that precipitation reaction. Aqueous silver ions, aqueous halide ions give solid silver halide precipitate. So if that was a chloroalkane, we'd get silver chloride there, which is a white precipitate. If that was a bromoalkane, we'd get a cream precipitate of silver bromide. And if it was an iodoalkane, we'd get a yellow precipitate of silver iodide. Okay, so I'll run through the procedure now, step by step. And then once I've done that, I'll actually show you the results of the experiment that I've done. So the first thing you do is you take equal volumes, you'd measure out equal volumes of the halogenoalkane, and they've got to be the same chain length, that's really important. So the ones we use in college are the um, halobutanes, so I use chlorobutane, bromobutane, and iodobutane, and so you measure equal volumes of those into three separate test tubes. The next thing you would do is you'd add a small volume of ethanol to the halogenoalkanes, and what that does is it helps the chemicals to mix better together when the reaction takes place. You'd then get three more test tubes and you'd add equal volumes of silver nitrate solution to those. You then place all six test tubes in a water bath at around about 50 degrees C and you'd leave them there for five to 10 minutes. And that just makes sure that everything's at the same temperature. So once they've had their required time in the water bath, you'd take one of your haloalkanes out, remember there's ethanol in there as well, and you'd take out one of the silver nitrate test tubes, you'd mix them together and start timing. And of course, you would stop timing when you see the precipitate appear, and remember, the white precipitate would indicate the presence of silver chloride, so obviously that would be produced from a chloroalkane, cream, silver bromide from a bromoalkane, yellow precipitate, silver iodide from an iodoalkane. And then finally, once you've got your time, the rate would be expressed as one over the time, and that would have the units seconds to the minus one. So the next thing we'll do is we'll look at the results of my experiment that I did in college. You can see my apparatus there. We have the water bath at 50 degrees C. 
The test tubes have been in for about five minutes now, so they should all be up to the same temperature. So I've got my three labelled test tubes. So the BR test tube obviously has the one bromobutane in, and the Cl, chloro, and so on. Now remember they're in ethanol, and the test tubes without any rubber bungs in, they've got the silver nitrate solution in. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take each one in turn and I'm going to mix the contents of the halogenoalkane tube with the silver nitrate solution and I'm going to time how long it takes for the precipitate to be formed. Then I'm going to divide 1 over the time and express that as the rate. So there we have the white precipitate of silver chloride and that's been formed from the hydrolysis of one chlorobutane in the presence of the silver nitrate solution and you can see from the stopwatch there that's taken 48.73 seconds. There's the cream precipitate of the silver bromide and that's taken 15.34 seconds. And finally we have the yellow precipitate of silver iodide that's been formed from the hydrolysis of iodobutane and that's taken a really short amount of time, 2.42 seconds. So there's all three reactions on the board and the times are in blue and the one over time, so the rate I've expressed to three decimal places and they're in red. So you can see a nice pattern there that the chlorobutane is hydrolyzed the slowest, has the lowest rate, whereas the iodobutane has the fastest rate. So we're going to explain why that's the case now using the mechanism. So we're going to look at the mechanism now for the reaction that we've just carried out. So I'm representing the halogenoalkane like this. So there's the four carbons and the halogen. I'm not specifying the halogen in the mechanism. I'm just using X. The water molecule, remember oxygen has two lone pairs on it. And if you remember from the mechanism, the halogen's more electronegative than the carbon. And so we have a dipole across this bond. So this carbon is electron deficient and therefore the pair, a pair of electrons from the oxygen, the lone pair, will be attracted to this carbon and that will have a knock-on effect on the pair of electrons in the bond. They're already being attracted to the halogen. They're going to be completely repelled onto the X and break the bond by heterolytic fission. So there's two factors at play. We've got the bond polarity. So that's the size of the dipole across this bond. And that's going to influence how strongly the nucleophile is attracted. Remember, water is a nucleophile. It's an electron pair donor. How strongly this water molecule is attracted to this carbon. So you can see that the, the carbon-chlorine bond is going to have the largest dipole across it. So I've tried to represent that as a large green delta plus delta minus. You can see there the dipoles are getting smaller. And that's because the electronegativities in the halogen atom are getting lower. So the nucleophile will be most strongly attracted to this carbon, less strongly attracted to this carbon. So you might think, well, this should react fastest. However, the other factor at play is the bond enthalpy. So that's the strength. That's the amount of energy it takes to break a mole of this bond. So I've got these written up for you here. So you can see that the CCL bond has the largest bond enthalpy. It takes the most amount of energy to break a mole of this bond. Now, if you remember back to the times that were recorded, the CI or the, the iodobutane had the fastest rate. So what that's telling us is, yes, the dipole's very small compared to the others, 
So the, the nucleophile is not as strongly attracted to that carbon, but because the bond's got a low bond enthalpy, in other words, it's easy to break, that makes the reaction faster. And so what we can learn from this is the critical factor that determines the rate of hydrolysis isn't the polarity, it's the bond enthalpy.